This case study is all about the Night Stalker. Um, if you've never heard of the Night Stalker, there is a pretty decent um, and very new uh, Netflix special. Well, special is a hard is a word, maybe not the best word, um, on the police work surrounding uh, the capture of Richard Ramirez, aka the Night Stalker. Um, that is decent. Um, I think that this case in particular is fairly horrifying. Um, this is, in my opinion, like the absolute definition of a boogeyman. Um, he is, a, he is, he gives me the creeps for sure. So let's talk about, you know, all about the Night Stalker. In the early hours of morning, he would creep into their homes. Under the cover of darkness, he would remove screen windows to inflict terror on unsuspecting couples. The serial killer known as the Night Stalker violated the sanctity of the home throughout California in the warm spring and summer months of 1984 and 1985, leaving a trail of victims in his wake. In June 1984, when an elderly woman was found slain in her bed, police didn't know that it was only the beginning. Jenny Vincow had been beaten and stabbed so savagely that her head had nearly been severed. The apartment had been ransacked, but the only evidence found was a single fingerprint on the screen window, which had been removed to gain access to the home. It would be more than a year before the Night Stalker would strike again. In March 1985, he began a five-month killing spree that left Californians reeling. On the evening of March 17th, Maria Hernandez arrived home and parked her car in her garage of her L.A. apartment. She was then attacked, shot at, and left for dead. Her assailant didn't know that the bullet ricocheted off of keys that Hernandez had in her hand, and she survived the attack. Her roommate heard the gunshot and hid, but was discovered and was also shot. An hour later, a third victim was shot after being pulled from her car that was idling at a stoplight. The murderer stole the orange Toyota from his third victim and made off into the night. Ten days later, the police would learn that they had a serial killer on the loose. An intruder entered the home of the Zazara family as they slept. He immediately shot and killed Mr. Zazara and then tied up his wife. After searching for valuables, he shot Maxine Zazara multiple times and then mutilated her body with a kitchen knife from the home. While little evidence was found, police did discover footprints in the flower bed, flower bed next to the home. They were also able to recover 22 caliber bullets, which they matched to those of the triple homicide on March 17th. Over the next few weeks, the pattern would continue. Couples asleep in their bed would be suddenly awakened by someone in their room. The men would be shot and killed almost immediately, sometimes while they were still sleeping, while the woman would be tied up. They were often sexually assaulted and beaten. Sometimes they were killed and mutilated post-mortem. Several times the killer drew pentagrams either on victims or on walls. Survivors reported the man smelled rancid, had rotted crooked teeth, and would talk about Satan as he carried out assaults. The media dubbed the serial killer the Valley Killer, the Walk-In Intruder, and then finally the name that stuck, the Night Stalker. In August of 1985, the killings moved to the San Francisco Bay Area. The mayor held a press conference in regard to the bout of violence and in it divulged that the ballistics and shoe prints at the crime scenes matched the LA Night Stalker. The police were furious as they believed the serial killer was watching the news and paying attention to the coverage of his crimes. They would later discover that the perpetrator threw his shoes off the Golden Gate Bridge after seeing the news report. The killings moved back to the Los Angeles area after that as Californians and the nation were both captivated and terrified by the Night Stalker. One partial print. The police finally caught a break in the case in August when 13-year-old James Romero III unknowingly came face to face with the killer. The Romeros had just returned from a family vacation and James, who slept most of the car ride home, found he couldn't sleep in the hot August night. Around midnight, he went out to the family camper to retrieve a pillow he had left inside. He was distracted by a sound coming from the back of the house and decided to investigate, thinking it was an animal. After a quick search and not finding anything, James went to the garage to work on his mini bike while the rest of his family slept. 
It was while working on the bike that James heard footsteps on the gravel path along the side of the garage. He quickly hid and then sprinted into the house to wake his family. The Romero family had items stolen from their garage in the past, and so James thought it was a prowler again. After waking his dad, he ran out to the garage to see if anyone was still there. He watched a man get into an orange Toyota wagon, turn the car around, and stare him down as he drove off. James ran back inside and wrote down what he remembered of the license plate. The police were called, and upon investigation, they found a dead bird in the shadowed area next to the sliding glass door that led to the master bedroom. Later that evening, the Night Stalker would kill again, in a home only 1.5 miles from James and his family. It would be several days before police would recover the orange Toyota with plates matching James' sighting abandoned near a strip mall. The car had been carefully wiped down, leaving no visible evidence behind. The police tried a technique which had recently been developed in Tokyo, utilizing something called cyanoacrylate vapor, also known as superglue fuming. When heated, chemicals in superglue will bind to amino acids in invisible prints. A white latent print can appear on the surface of what once looked like to have no print. It was through this process that police were able to recover a single partial print on the rearview mirror of the car. The Los Angeles Police Department was now faced with a daunting task, matching the print in the car to the 1.7 million fingerprint cards on file in the system. If the police had been forced to do side-by-side -side visual comparisons through the cards, it would have taken a fingerprint expert 67 years to comb through the cards trying to make a match. Luckily, in 1985, the LAPD had a new computer system installed that could help. The new system, known as APHIS, Automated Fingerprint Identification System, worked by comparing the distance between various points on fingerprint patterns. The new APHIS program was capable of comparing 60,000 prints per second. The technology behind APHIS had first been developed by the FBI in the 1960s and was slowly being installed in police departments. One downfall of the APHIS system used in the 1980s was that one system couldn't talk to another. So even if the killer's prints were on file in a different city, it would not produce a match in the LA system. Police entered the partial print recovered from the mirror into the system and hoped that they would find a match. After several tense minutes, APHIS had a hit. A 25-year-old, originally from El Paso, Texas, who had several misdemeanor crimes under his belt and had been fingerprinted after a traffic violation. It was these sets of prints that allowed APHIS to match the stolen orange car to Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Catching a Killer Police quickly plastered Ramirez's picture everywhere, asking for the help of the public in finding him. They also tracked down his relatives and staked out their homes in hopes of catching him. Despite their efforts, it would be ordinary citizens that would capture the killer. Ramirez entered a liquor store on the morning of Saturday, August 31st, 1985, and picked up a newspaper. Upon seeing his face on the cover, he bolted out the door and began to run down the street, but a mob began to chase him. Ramirez cut through yards, ran across a greenway, and attempted to carjack a woman before he was caught by the angry group of citizens, who then beat him until police arrived. It took more than two years for Ramirez to go on trial, and while he was responsible for more slayings, rapes, and assaults, he was ultimately charged with 13 counts of murder, 5 counts of attempted murder, 11 counts of sexual assault, and 14 counts of burglary. During the trial, Ramirez showed no remorse. He winked at witnesses such as young James Romero, who was forced to testify in court. He drew pentagrams on his hand and proclaimed he was a Satanist. The jury eventually convicted Ramirez. He was sentenced to death in the gas chamber. When asked for a reaction after his sentencing, Ramirez stated, big deal, death always went with the territory. Life in prison. Ramirez would never face the gas chamber despite his sentencing. He spent more than 20 years on death row appealing his death sentence. During that time, he met and married a woman, and after that relationship, he later became engaged to a 23-year-old woman. Eventually, in 2013, Ramirez died of B-cell lymphoma, a type of cancer. A plethora of books have been written. 
TV shows and movies made about that terrifying time and the disturbingly unapologetic man who carried out horrific crimes. Americans who felt safe in their homes were forever changed as they locked their doors and windows in fear. The story of the Night Stalker took on a boogeyman status as Ramirez went down in history as one of the most chilling serial killers of all time.